Hey guys, in this video, I want to address a question that was asked in one of my uh, videos. So the question was, um, if I scroll down here, it's by uh, General Animations uh, 9284. And the question is, what's the best way to sculpt Afro hair and fade in ZBrush? So in addition to my response, I also wanted to reach out to one of my personal favorite artists uh, named Danny Williams. And let me show you his art station. So this is Danny's art station. Uh, Danny Williams is also known as Point Pusher. Um, again, he's been in this uh, space for a very, very long time. Uh, many years ago, I found his videos and his training, and that's one of the uh, biggest reasons why I was uh, so drawn to ZBrush and sculpting and stylized characters. Uh, if we click on the About section, you can see that Danny has worked on absolutely mind-blowing projects from Netflix to Diablo to uh, Activision and uh, even some of my favorites. Uh, my uh, kids and I love this movie Rio and unbelievable. So I uh, was lucky enough to get a response from Danny about how he would approach creating stylized hair or afro hair in uh, ZBrush. He actually took the time and created a video response for me personally, but I felt that it was so amazing that I asked his permission to post it uh, for you guys to see as well. So let's uh, let's watch Dana's video and um, I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did and it's full of incredible tricks from the best. All right, so let's uh, listen in. Hey, so your question was, uh, how can we get stylized uh, Afro hair? And I'm assuming when you say Afro hair, you mean an actual Afro, like the hairstyle, not just hair that belongs to someone of African descent. So what I'm going to do here is use this old model, but I wanted to look at a good target first, right? So in this picture, young Michael Jackson, we could see like a ton of breakup and fuzz on the edges, right? If you were going to sculpt something like that it would take you forever and probably wouldn't be worth it there's a lot of other methods that you could use to get something this refined but because you said it was stylized and cartoony i don't think we want this level of realism either if we look at the next example we could see that it's a lot less break up on the edges but there still is some but we can see that there's actual sort of clumps right we could see sort of circular or round clumps of hair inside this big, soft, luxurious afro. I think what we're talking about is going a little more graphic like this since, you know, you mentioned that you wanted it to be stylized. And at the end, we'll talk about a couple of strategies for getting like a quick visualization for something like a fade. Now, none of these things is actually like a production ready technique. This is just um, sort of uh, almost like visual development for this sort of technique, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and grab a sphere. And I'm not actually going to use this sphere. What I'm going to do instead, I'm going to hit uh, Make Poly Mesh 3D. And actually, let me just get a regular sphere. Sorry, I have a couple of other objects sitting in the scene. So I'm going to, you know, our sphere has poles on it. And we don't really want to have poles on it because we don't want our sculpting to be interrupted, uh, you know, by everything coming to a point like that. So after you get your Make Poly Mesh 3D, you can hit um, or get your sphere, you can hit Make Poly Mesh 3D. You can come down here to Initialize, and I'm going to go to Q Sphere, and I'm just going to leave it at a 2x2 two two sphere. And we can see what we get is something like this, right? Um, something that looks like almost if you have a box in Maya and you smooth it, you get something that looks like this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take this, and just so we know which one it is, because I have a few of them in here, because uh, I was practicing before I recorded this, I'm going to go ahead and say Afro. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to go to my sculpt. I'm going to say insert, choose afro. Uh, I believe it comes in down here. Yep. So now I'm going to go ahead and scale this guy up. So I'm going to move him up here and scale him up quite a bit. And we're going to go ahead and just take this and intersect it with the head. Now we're going to shape this a bit, right? So I'm going to take it and move it back like this. And I'm going to divide it a couple of times. So we can see it's starting now with only 26 active points. So 26 vertices on the whole model. Uh, for me, my active points is down here, my weird UI, um, down in the lower left right here. Um, so now if I control D, control D, control D, 
uh, we can see now we're at a thousand five hundred points so uh, I'm also going to take this uh, I'll just sample a color from the eyes here this uh, and just say fill object so now uh, it's filled um, and my UI is a little bit different um, that stuff lives under color fill object you know I know you know this but just in case uh, anybody in your audience um, on your channel doesn't know uh, so now I'm going to go ahead and take this and just sort of slide it back there and we can see we start to get the basic silhouette right we could play with this quite a bit um, and really this initial first big shape that's where I in my opinion you should spend most of your time uh, because that's really going to give you the most bang for your buck um, in terms of the the overall look that you might want so really quickly I might take this and I might do something like this I'm gonna grab my move brush make it a lot bigger uh, I'll drop down to subdivision levels a couple of times and then I'm just gonna go ahead and do this now you'll notice also my polyframe is turned on but in inside of the polyframe something a lot of people don't recognize is like you can see there's a little fill option right here it's tiny if I turn that off I can see my polyframe with my model under there instead of the poly um, group color right so if I turn fill back on the poly group color is still there but I could turn that off and now I can just see my model so I like to model this way uh, sometimes because uh, it helps you see at the lowest resolution what the shape is so like for example you know if we think of this as like the front plane right this whole box right here and then the side plane top plane bottom plane right then I could say hey I want the front and the sides to sort of taper in a little bit let me grab my symmetry and it just makes it easy to see what I'm doing shape wise right so uh, I use that quite a bit so I'll just take a minute and just sort of shape some of this um, just to get a shape that corresponds to this head and um, you know one of the things I'm looking at is like you know the angle of the chest and the way it curves back maybe I want this to relate to that right so let's take the back of this and sort of curve it like that I want to just have an implied line like that um, same thing here like the head comes out like this right and, and the shoulders come up like this maybe I want to have something that relates to those shapes a little bit right so something to counter this shape um, and that means we're going to put a little more weight up here and eventually you know hopefully you find something that sort of works for what you need um, I, I won't make this a two-hour video I promise where I'm spending forever shaping this thing um, uh, but let's let's say we liked this initial shape right so we can get to the other steps um, once you have this shape maybe you go up a few uh, subdivision levels and we can start to like you know I'm just using the the uh, alt with move so it's moving in and out along the normal and then I can really try to manipulate the hairline a little bit and I like I find when I'm working a lot I look at the silhouette like this and I'm using alt and just sort of moving the silhouette like that and like from this angle I'm looking at the jawline and how the jawline relates to it and then I turn it a little bit and I see what that looks like from another angle and this working this way takes a lot of um, patience but it does it I think it pays off uh, because it uh, really works from multiple angles you know like a like a sculpture should right um, and it's not just only one strong angle so let's say now we have something like this I'm gonna um, divide this again a couple of times and again I'm doing this at an accelerated pace I would probably take more time and we will end up using surface noise to get our fine detail but now that we've got a big shape that we sort of like I could probably let's actually go down a little bit in resolution and I'm just gonna uh, do the alternate smooth so shift press let go of shift just to bring those corners in a little bit because it's reading as a little bit too square all right cool so that's a little bit better so now let's go up in resolution uh, my highest resolution now is 24,000 points uh, I'm just gonna frame everything up 
So now, uh, before I go adding surface noise, right, we're going to end up adding, if I go down here to surface, and I go to noise, right, we have uh, surface noise functions that we can use um, where I could take the noise scale and we could see what's happening here in this little preview, right? So it sort of shows you where it's going. But I think one of the things that you can do before that, if it fits the style of what you're going for, then you can um, break this up manually a little bit. And I'm going to do that by making some little circular shapes. Now, I don't want to make donuts or bagels, right? I don't want a hole in the middle. What I want to do is I want to make like a little cinnamon roll kind of, right? Where I um, just gently, right? Because if I go like this and I make a big shape, it's really going to change the silhouette. But these smaller shapes, they still live inside the silhouette, right? So I'm just going to gently go in and make a bunch of different sized little shapes like this. And I'm not concerned with uh, breaking the symmetry yet because um, the surface noise will do a lot of that for us, right? So I'm just going to go around, and if you really want to indicate um, sort of hair length, you can go, you know, tighter circles that maybe have a little bit more raise to them, closer to the scalp. And then as you get further away from the cranium, you could say, okay, well, let's make these a little more gentle because, you know, the hair is long. Um, it's just along the length of the hair, there are a lot of twists, turns, and curls, right? Um, that's what makes black hair look like black hair. So you then want to go ahead and say, okay, cool. Um, as it gets further out from that point, wait, how did I lose symmetry here? Let me make sure this model is symmetrical. I'm going to drop down to my lowest resolution. Oh, it looks like it is, I can't tell. It looks like it looks like it is asymmetrical. Maybe I made some moves that were not symmetrical. So uh, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to say geometry, delete lower. And then I'll also say delete higher. So now I'm just at 6,000 points here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to um, deformation and I'm going to hit smart resim. And okay, that should give me something that is symmetrical. You could also do a mirror and weld, but because I'm working with sort of organized topology here, Smart Resim will retain that topology. So now if I take this and go reconstruct subdiv, I can get my other subdivision levels back, right? And it's still symmetrical now. So um, otherwise, if I was just dynameshing, I would use um, modified topology, mirror and weld. But that would give me something where I can't rebuild my subdivision levels, right? So uh, let's go now and divide this back up one more time. So I'm back up to that 24,000. Uh, my symmetry is turned on. I guess early on before I turned on symmetry, I made some moves that made it asymmetrical and I wasn't paying close enough attention. Uh, so now, but you know, again, once you sort of realize it's easy to recover from some of that stuff. Um, so now let's go and take a look out Add everything and I'll just add a few more of these little swirlies all right so now we have sort of a secondary noise that's breaking up the surface a little bit um, because I went down and I rebuilt the subdivision levels and all that these got softer which I think looks kind of nice um, so I might just go ahead and hold uh, do that shift smooth and just smooth out these other guys it won't really matter once we get the surface noise on there but let's say we have something like this and now let's go ahead and let's say uh, if I go over here to surface um, I go to noise and the first noise that I'm gonna make is big I, usually with most things I work big to small right um, uh, if you think about it in the context of sculpting like a face right or even drawing a face the typical you know there's lots of different methods right um, to, to draw a face but typically you want something that's going to give you an indication of the the way that the face is facing right the way that the eyes the gaze is facing so you know a lot of people use the oval and then the t on the oval you know and that will give you general face direction some people use like the loomis method or the riley method or all these other drawing methods right so um but basically your first marks in any of these things is really about establishing 
you know, hey, where's the head looking, right? So think about that philosophy, or if you were sculpting a, um, a character with clay, uh, you need to have the eye socket really worked out well before you start working on the eyelid, right? Digital gives us a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, wiggle room where if it's not quite right, we can go back and make adjustments, right? But in other media, you don't really have that. And I do find it's easier to evaluate where I'm going. The whole reason, because I am using digital tools, the whole reason to still work in a linear fashion where you work big to small is that it lets you evaluate when you go from step one to step two, is this correct, right? Instead of just sort of sketching all the way around, which some people work that way. Sometimes I work that way, but uh, for the most part, I try to work more methodical these days like this. So I'm going to take this big surface noise and say, okay, now, you know, the number of points that we have, the surface noise is not applied, right? If I turn it on or off, it's not really applied yet. It's just giving us like a preview. And if I go ahead and hit apply to mesh, what we'll see is we don't really have enough resolution to capture all of that surface noise. It did do a nice thing where it gave me like a pretty nice like shape, right? So I'm going to undo that. So now it's unapplied, right? And I'm going to divide it a few more times. So let's get it into, you know, this is 1.5 million polys and I'm going to hit apply to mesh. And we can see that we have a lot more of that detail. And now let's layer on a few surface noises. So I'm going to go back to noise. I'm going to hit edit. I'm going to take this and I'm going to turn the scale down a bit. And then we can play with the strength, right? So maybe I turn the strength up a little bit. And I'm going to hit apply to mesh. And then, you know, after a few rounds of this, what you can do is you can go really small and really strong. And now I'm going to hit apply to mesh. And what you see you get is something that looks like, you know, the conglomeration of that sort of um, big hair. So if I don't like how far off the surface some of these have come, I can hit undo, go back to edit, and now I can take the strength and make adjustments to the strength. I can hit OK, and I can hit apply to mesh. And I think this is a little bit better. Like it doesn't break up. It breaks up the edge just enough to look sort of natural, but it still lets me keep my graphic shape. And because I'm working with subdivision levels, if I drop all the way down to my lowest level, again, I can use that principle of showing the polyframe, and then I can sort of make changes to whatever I want, right? So if we wanted to take this and make it more of a flat top than a afro, Again, for me, I like seeing that, you know, I know that this top box is the top of the hair. So I can give that top the exact shape that I want. Then I can see the back of the hair is this box. So I can give that the exact shape that I want. So I use this polyframe without the color trick all the time. Um, maybe you do this already, uh, but if you don't, it's, it's a useful one. Um, so now, let's say I do something like that. And now when I go back up in my divisions, I still have all of my detail there, right? Um, now, something else you can do, I'm going to grab the color from here, so just C and do that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build in a hairline with just color. So I'm going to go to my uh, standard brush. I'm going to make sure it's set to just RGB. And I'm going to come over here and go to the head model. And I'm just going to paint on... And I'll solo it for a second. And I'll paint on like a way thicker edge than I think I need. And I know I don't have to, you know, paint this part because it's going to be covered by the other hair, but it just looks weird if it's not painted. So. He all of a sudden goes from like 12 to, you know, 51. So let's say something like that. Um, and then what I'm going to do is now I'm going to make my brush a little bit smaller. I'm going to hold C and grab this color of the skin here. And we can tighten up the hairline. So he just came from the barber. And we can make the hairline really tight.
it just got lined up and then the next thing that we can do is we can make our brush really big and again I'm using that white color and I'm gonna go ahead and take the RGB intensity and I'm gonna turn it down and you can just lightly look like this and maybe in the back we'll do the same thing so you got a old school fade just all the way around It'll just give you that sort of soft taper. Uh, and then maybe I'll make my brush a little bit. Those sideburns are a little thick. So I'll make my brush a little bit thicker. Or sorry, a little bit smaller. Go back down in size. Maybe I'll do that. Just tighten that up a little bit. So now when we turn on the hair again, we've got something that looks like this. And what we can start to do is we can go get a noise brush, right? So I can take the head and I can divide it. Um, and let's go ahead and get our standard brush again and I'm going to go ahead and turn off RGB and I'm going to turn on Z add and I'm going to go to morph target and I'm going to hit store morph target uh, and actually you know what before I do that I'm going to divide it one more time so we're now at six million polygons and we're on the, the head model here so I'm going to hit store morph target and then what I'm going to do is with my brush I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to choose uh, one of these noise patterns, let's say like this alpha alpha 7 maybe and I'm gonna go ahead and Do that and let's just see what we get And you know what I'm gonna set this to instead of dots. I'm gonna set it to spray And I want just something that looks close enough to the other noise pattern. Because when, by the time we get to the lower section where it's all skin, um, we don't really need to see a lot of hair, right? Remember we used that morph target, right? So. I have a morph target stored so like if I were to come up here and hit switch it'll go back to our original shape um, but I can also come in here and go to morph and if I drag this to the right we can start to get so I can be a little heavy-handed with it and then a combination of playing with that and then going to the hair and starting to like if I drop down in resolution a little bit and I want to drop down in resolution to the point where I don't really see any details because then I know that when I'm pulling the edges around, when I go to subdivide, it's actually going to give me um, detail back in those areas. If I start pulling around areas where I can see the detail, um, if I'm at a higher subdivision level, then when I go up to the highest level, it's going to be um, like stretched out. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just divide, 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 divide. And we can start to get something like that and I can see what that looks like. I just want them to sort of integrate. Um, and let's do that. Move that in a little bit. There's some of the stretching that I was talking about. But we go up in resolution, it seems fine. So now they're starting to blend together a little bit. Um, you just want to keep constantly turning to make sure that that's the case. And then I can come back over here to the head. Let's pretend like I spent more time on that and made it. A little nicer uh, and I'm just gonna grab the morph brush so I'm gonna hit MO oops oops let's go here let's hit M and where is there you go sorry it's MG the morph brush so now this will let me go back to my original morph targets I can come down here and go really small and I can come over here and I can clean up that hairline again I can basically sort of keep the edges that I made just in that one spot, right? So sort of a silly example, but technique wise, you'd have to spend more time to get what you need. But technique wise, this is basically the way that I would try to treat um, something like this. So hopefully this makes some sense. Let me know uh, if it doesn't. Um, 
Oh, another thing related to the polyframe before I forget. Um, a lot of people don't know in the preferences, there is a preference. So I'm going to hold control and go over this. So it's under preferences, draw PF color, polyframe color. So if you go up here to preferences, go down to draw. And then there's this PF color here. I have it in my UI here. And what I can do sometimes is depending on what I'm working on, right? If I was working on something that had a much darker um, shader applied to it or a darker poly paint, it would be hard to see this uh, darker polyframe. So to still see it, you can take this and you can change the polyframe color, right? So if we take the skin here and we go to sort of a medium gray and I fill the object there, I can make my polyframe color white. And you can also, there's a slider also for how uh, opaque the or, or transparent the polyframe color is, right? So both of those things, again, live in preferences, draw, right? So I've got polyframe color and then this uh, polyframe uh, opacity here. So if I go down to my lowest level here, I'm going to turn off polyframe and then turn it back on. And that will also let me keep that low res polyframe even when I go up. And then I can go ahead and you can change this color to be anything you want, right? So I could make the polyframe red, right? And I can make it completely opaque or just somewhat opaque or whatever. But because I like to work with, you know, somewhat organized topology, even if it's just Z remeshed or whatever, um, a lot of the time, and I use the polyframe to help guide me, like, here I could see I'm getting this little wave here in the cheek like this. And I know I'm sort of getting off topic here, but I just think this is a cool thing that a lot of people um, don't really utilize. But I could sort of see that wave now and it just helps me fix and organize things because I can see that there. So when I go up in resolution here, I will get a cleaner, more readable shape because I could see that, right? So, um, yeah, I like to use this quite a bit. Hopefully it's coming through in the video that faintly. Um, but like if I made it like a blue or a green or something, maybe it'd be easier to detect. Um, let's see. Yeah, something like that. Um, but anyway, hopefully this was, um, you know, helpful for what you needed. Um, you know, thank you again for the kind words and I'll talk to you soon. Later. Wow, that was just simply amazing. Danny, thank you so much for taking the time and replying uh, with the video. I really appreciate it. Uh, you guys, I hope you uh, learned something new and we'll see you in our next video.